Thank you. I want you to take your Bible and turn to Genesis 37. Now, I know that uh, you may or may not be familiar with the 37th chapter of Genesis. It's the story of Joseph. Uh, I could assume that you know it already. We didn't read it, but uh, we'll read uh, parts of it as we go through it today. Genesis chapter 37, of course, is the story that begins of Joseph. And the account of Joseph, you can, you can read it on several possible levels, one of which is this story is just a fascinating story of a doting father who pampers his son of jealous brothers and also a, seduced, a seductive and an adulterous wife and an international food crisis. It's all chocked full in this, uh, this account. Also, Second way of looking at the story of Joseph is that Joseph is a very rich illustration of Jesus the Messiah. Perhaps you've noticed that before. Give you a few examples. He is the beloved son of his father. He's obedient to his father's will. He is hated and rejected by his brethren. He is sold as a slave for uh, some silver coins. He's falsely accused, and he is unjustly punished, and then he is elevated from the place of suffering to a powerful throne in which he is able to deliver people and even nations from death. Third way to perhaps consider Joseph is that Joseph is a way in which the very heart of God is revealed to us. And when we see God's heart in the life of Joseph, he is revealed as a promise-keeping God who has a mighty hand that is able to rule and even overrule the decisions that people make, ultimately build a hero who saves not only his family, but uh, creates a nation that brings worldwide blessing. Genesis chapter 37 is really the unfolding of a deeply dysfunctional family. That's what we would call it today. A dysfunctional family. A family that has a destructive force at work in it that God just graciously overrules to display his glorious power for good, not only to Joseph's immediate family and extended family and then the nation of Israel, but again, to all of us. It's an amazing story. It involves you as well as them. And so let's take a moment and uh, pray, and then let's look to see what God has for us personally here in this 37th chapter of Genesis today. Heavenly Father, it certainly is good to be here. Thank you for bringing us here. Thank you that we have the health to be here. Thank you that we're, we don't fear to be here. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to have your Bible and your word right in our hands and able to see it with our own eyes. But I pray that you would also give us Holy Spirit anointing not only to understand it, but Lord, to carry it out, to do it, to apply it to our daily life. Thank you for the story of Joseph. It's a wonderful account of you at work providentially in not only a single life, but in a single life, touching numerous lives, our lives. We're part of the story. It's amazing. And it's you. And I'm thankful for it. Now open our spiritual eyes that uh, you might accomplish your purpose in us through this. And I pray that you would save any lost and that you would sanctify those that are your people. In Jesus' name, amen. So I see really two main things in this 37th chapter. What I call dreams. There's a couple of dreams that Joseph has in this chapter those dreams quickly turn into a nightmare. So I call this dreams a nightmare. 
That's what I see. The first 11 verses is all about his dreams. You know that most people dream an average of three to six times uh, in their sleep cycle normally. And each dream lasts between five and 20 minutes. I hope you don't have any while I'm preaching. <laughs> but it's, it's, some people don't think that they dream. Uh, you know why? Because most dreams aren't remembered. Approximately 95% of our dreams are forgotten. But I'm telling you, the two dreams that Joseph has recorded here are unforgettable. Did you know that the, event, the inventor of the sewing machine, Elias Howe, said that he got the idea through a dream? Did you also know that Niles Bohr, a Nobel Prize winner, actually claimed that he saw the structure of the atom in a dream? Dreams have always been an important way that God spoke to people. He warns through dreams. He commands through dreams. If you study the scripture, you'll find he encourages through dreams. He guides through them. And here, in these two dreams, he reveals the future. I want you to note uh, verse 1 of chapter 36 and compare that with verse 2 of chapter 37. In 36, 1, we read, Now these are the generations of Esau. In chapter 37, where we are this morning, verse 2, these are the generations of Jacob, and the next word is Joseph. I do that comparison so that you recognize that this is the continuing account of Jacob. It hasn't ended. He's going to appear again in this whole, but the main character happens to be Joseph at this point in the story, but it is the account, the continuing story of this man Jacob. And I think that that's fitting then that we should understand that these two dreams that are recorded in the first 11 verses of chapter 37 have their basis, listen to me, Joseph's two dreams have their basis in Jacob's dream. Remember, he dreamed too, didn't he? He, Joseph wasn't the only dreamer. He dreamed in chapter uh, 28, and uh, the, the dream specifically in verses uh, 12 through 15 of uh, chapter 28 of Genesis, when he dreams, he sees a ladder that is set up on earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And the angels of God, Jacob dreamed, were ascending and descending on this ladder that went from earth to heaven. And in that dream, God spoke to him. The Lord stood above that ladder and said, I am. There it is. In fact, the I is in italics. You know what that means? Okay. I am the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, of Abraham, thy father, God of Isaac, the land where you lie. I'm going to give it to you and to your descendants. And uh, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. Thou shalt spread abroad to the west, east, north, south. And uh, in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And I'm going to be with you. Again, I am in, in italics. I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Well, guess what? It's come full circle. Jacob's back in the land, remember? He got back in the land in chapter 35. And so here we are. This is a continuation as verse 2. These are the generations of Jacob. And it's all based upon Jacob's dream which is the basis for Joseph's dream. You know what Jacob's dream was? Jacob's dream was a God encounter. It was Jacob encountering God and God confirming to Jacob the covenant that he made with his grandfather Abraham that I'm going to give you a specific land, this land that you are now in, that you are dreaming in. 
I'm going to give this land to you, and I am going to give you many descendants, and they're going to have this land, and I am going to make you and your descendants, I'm going to bless you and your descendants, and, and they're going to be a blessing to this entire world, all the nations. That's what Jacob's dream was about, as well as that 15th verse of chapter 28, I'm going to be with you. You're going to have my continued presence all the time with you. When you leave this land, uh, I'm going to see to it that I'll be with you out of this land, and I'll bring you back to this land and be with you in it. Now, Jacob's dream is really the basis for Joseph's two dreams here. If you remember with me from last week, one of Jacob's sons, in fact, not one, the oldest son, the son that rightfully should have received the birthright. The oldest son, the son of Leah, the firstborn of Jacob, his name was Reuben. He messed up big time. He was a very lust, sinfully lustful man. And we noticed also that probably feeding into that lust, there was selfish leadership in his heart as well, because he wanted to uh, nail down for himself the position as the firstborn, and he wanted it early. And that's why he uh, had that immoral relationship with, his, uh, with one of the, uh, his father's wives' concubine. And because of that, if you recall, in Genesis chapter 49, at the end of Jacob's life, when he is giving his blessings to his 12 boys, he tells Reuben, you forfeited the birthright. You forfeited the position of the birthright that belongs to the firstborn son. So even though you are my firstborn, you are not going to be the recipient of the blessing of the firstborn. You're not going to have the birthright. So Jacob's dream, before we hit Joseph's dream, Jacob's dream, he had a failed son, didn't he? He had a failed son who was supposed to be the firstborn son, and he was chronologically, but he wasn't spiritually, and he wasn't in actuality. Because the firstborn son, note verse 2, these are the generations of, Jake, uh, of, of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, and with the sons of Zilpah. And you know who Bilhah was? That was the one that Reuben had that immoral relationship with, right? He was with her sons, and with also the sons of the other concubine, who were shepherds. His father's wives, Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now, before I touch that, I wanted to, you to listen to this. I'm reading now from 1 Chronicles chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was firstborn, but forasmuch as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not to be reckoned after his birthright. For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler. But the birthright was Joseph's. Got that? First Chronicles sets the, the record straight. We have a failed son who was replaced, and there was another firstborn son that took his place, and very clearly it is Joseph. The scripture tells us that. In uh, 1 Chronicles 5, 2, it was Joseph. He's the firstborn now. He's the one. So at 17 years old, where we meet Joseph for the first time in, in verse 2, at 17 years of age, he has authority over his brothers. He's the firstborn now. Literally, that uh, phrase could be read, he was tending, actually shepherding over his brethren in the flock. He is assuming his position that was graciously given him 
as the firstborn son. So the failed son is replaced by Joseph, who becomes the firstborn son. And of course, look at verses 3 and 4. Now Israel, that's Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him, and also he was the son, the firstborn son of his favorite wife, who was who? Rachel. Rachel. He loved him. And so he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him. And they couldn't speak peaceably unto him. So you have a failed son. You have a firstborn son. And here is a favorite son. And he is shown to be the favorite son. Jacob shows his special preference and partiality for Joseph by making him, dressing him with a coat called here of many colors, which is really literally a long robe. It's a coat to the palms. In other words, it's a long coat that reaches to the palm of the hand and uh, down to the feet. It's a long-sleeved ceremonial robe with ornamentation on it. The only other time this phrase is used in the entire Bible is the robe that was worn by Tamar, who was the daughter of, uh, or, or the sister of Absalom, the daughter of David. And so it is the robe of royalty. It's the robe of a, of a princess. And in this case, it, he would be robed as a prince. And it was Jacob's way of revealing his choice of Joseph as the firstborn. Okay, he is the one that gets the first that gets the firstborn birthright, and thus it was a symbol of Joseph's su- supremacy and authority. And so, when he brings the evil report to his father Jacob, actually he's acting like a foreman uh, who is reporting to his supervisor. His brothers are like blue collar workers, and he's the white collar boss. That's really what's happening here as the favorite son. He's the chosen one. Okay, so that's all based in Jacob's dream. That's where we are now. But let's now, beginning in verse 5, let's look at the first dream of Joseph and then the second one. There's two of them. The first dream is verses 5 through 8. So I'll quickly read. Joseph dreamed a dream. He told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet even more. And he said unto them, Hear, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Okay, that's the first dream. Second dream, look with me. Picking up at uh, uh, at verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream, and he told it to his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother, probably Leah, because Rachel has passed by now. Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. So two dreams. And they're quite similar, aren't they? Uh, He shared them with his brothers. Uh, You know, that obviously served to increase the pain in his life that he was about to begin to suffer by sharing them. They envied him already. They hated him already. This just increased that, uh, those feelings, those attitudes. And uh, his father rebuked him when he shared that second dream with his father. Actually, the word rebuke there means he screamed at him. His father screamed at him. But that's not all he did. It also says, I think it's in that 11th verse, that his father observed this dream that was shared with him. That means he really pondered it. He was thinking about it. And perhaps 
he was making the connection of Jacob, uh, Joseph's dream with his own dream. And perhaps he was thinking, well, you know, God gave me a dream and it's come true. Maybe there's something to this dream that uh, he's shared with me. Joseph's dream. Quickly, very quickly, beginning in verse 12, develops into a nightmare. His dreams are shattered. You know, it's interesting that often uh, people have these these uh, maybe premonitions or or um, or notions of, of something wonderful happening to them, and they they're convinced it's going to happen, and then all of a sudden everything just goes south, so to speak, and their dreams fall apart. His dreams are shattered. It's like they never even happened. It's like they're dead and buried, forgotten. Let me tell you something. When you have these kinds of reversals in your life, it's not an accident. And it is probably more important than ever. It's critical that you see God in these kinds of shattered dreams, so to speak, in these kinds of reversals. It's critical that you see the Lord's hand in this and you trust Him in the midst of it and through it. In fact, when God made that covenant with Abraham, he told him in uh, Genesis chapter 15, he clued him in and he said, Abram, I want you to know something. Your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. What land was that? The land of Egypt. I mean, hundreds of years, the land of Egypt before they ever got there, before Joseph ever became that conduit through which the family and the nation would end up in Egypt. God warns Abram, your, your seed, they're going to become uh, strangers, foreigners in a land that's not theirs and shall serve them. They're going to be slaves there. And they shall afflict them 400 years and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Wow. I'm sure Jacob must have heard that story. But the fact is that God had a plan that was working. Even when the dreams got shattered, the plan was still in effect. God's purpose was not going to be thwarted. And you have to see yourself as part of the purpose and plan of God and thus see Him in it and trust Him in it and let Him see God, uh, let you see God at work in your circumstances. It's the plan that uh, a promise-keeping God is working a God with a mighty hand that is able to rule. He is able to overrule. He is ultimately able to build a person that would be used by him to save his family and to save even the nations of the earth by bringing blessing as God purposed it. In fact, going back to the 105th Psalm that we've read this morning already, listen to this, uh, this 17th verse. He sent a man before them. That's Joseph. God did. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, who was sold for a slave. God was in this. All this shattered dream. God was at work. And look at verse 12. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Now, what do we know about that spot? That was a place where Jacob... I think disobediently spent 10 years, purchased land there. They were probably taking their flocks uh, to land that Jacob had purchased. And But look, this was not a good place for them. This was an evil place. Evil happened in that spot. And it was a dangerous place for them. And so dad sends the firstborn, Joseph, to check out and make sure everything's all right. And so that's what's happening here. 
in that 12th verse. Verse 13, And Israel said to Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here I am. And he said, Go, I pray thee, See whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron and came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, that's Joseph. Behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? You think it was by accident that he hooked up with this man? That Jacob and this man crossed paths? I don't think so. I don't think anything's by accident in the plan of God. What are you seeking? What are you looking for? Verse 16. And he said, I seek my brothers, my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. The man said, they are departed hence. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. Isn't that interesting? The guy knew where they were. Maybe he was an angel. I don't know. And uh, when they saw him afar off, verse 18, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him, to slay him. Here's the nightmare. It's beginning to unfold in real aggression. The animosity has been building to now the situation is absolutely explosive in their hearts. It's a conspiracy, we're told in this verse 18. It's an absolute conspiracy. They hate him, and the envy and the hate have boiled in their hearts, and it's just waiting for the spark to set off the explosion, and here is the opportunity that sets it up. And they said to one another, verse 19, Behold, this dreamer cometh. This dreamer, this, this master, this master dream expert. <laughs> this one that thinks he's, the, he's the, the dreamer of the century. Here he comes. A conspiracy develops, we are told. They conspired against him to kill him their own brother. And look at what happens next. Verse 20, Come thou therefore, let us kill him. Cast him in some pit, and we'll say some evil beast has devoured him. We shall see what comes of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. Isn't that interesting? The guy that took Reuben's birthright stands up. Reuben stands up for the guy that took his birthright from him. See that? And uh, verse 22, And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into the, the pit. The pit is a cistern. I'll tell you a little bit about that. That's in the wilderness. And lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands and deliver him again to his father. So Reuben gives them an alternative. Look, let's, let's not kill him ourselves. Let's just put him in this cistern, in this pit, in the ground. And his desire was, when they're not looking, I'll help him to escape. I'll get him back to dad without anything happening. But uh, the brothers, they don't share that. It's really a pleasure to them to strip that coat that represented his authority and his position off of him and drop him into that pit, into that cistern, which is really, uh, it's, it's a deep pit in the ground with a long, narrow opening too high to crawl out of. You had to have a rope to get out of it. But it was a, it was a pit for collecting water that could be used to, I don't know, water the sheep or even or for people to drink. It, it caught the rainwater. And so that's where they put, evidently it was dry enough where he wouldn't drown. When they put him in it, there was Perhaps no water in it. It was just mud in the bottom. I don't know. But uh, this is what they, were, what, what they came up with. And look at what they do next. They took him, verse 24. They cast him into the cistern, into the pit. It was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread. They sat down to eat bread. So it's a conspiracy. But look at the apathy as well. It, they're, they're more than happy to strip him of this robe, to throw him in this pit, and then they're so cruel that they eat. No loss of appetite. 
they eat without any guilt or remorse or pity on their brother who is suffering and begging them to let him out. He's crying to be set free. And it doesn't bother them at all. Their hearts are so callous. They have such hardened hearts by their hate and their poison uh, through their envy that they have it not in their heart to help their poor brother, but to kill him. Now, folks, this is a good place for me to say, if you are thinking, what kind of animals are these men? That they would do this to their own flesh and blood, their own half-brother. That's your heart. That's my heart. That's the human heart. The human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and you and I don't even know the depths of our own heart. Which leads me to say this, these men needed a new heart, and so do all of us. We need new hearts. Some of you have a new heart. Some of you have had your heart renewed by the Spirit of God. That's why Jesus said, it shouldn't amaze you. You have to be born again. You must have a new heart. You must be regenerated. Your old heart will never do. You can never please God or gain favor with God or have the peace with God or have a place with God until you have a new heart. These men needed a heart that was redeemed. And thankfully, there is a Redeemer, and His name is Jesus, and He's the Messiah, and He's the Savior. He's the Redeemer. So they sold Him for the price of a slave. Look at verse 25. There was a company of Ishmaelites that came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And He said unto His brethren, what profit is it, Judah? Judah said this. What profit is it that we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and uh, let's let our hand not be upon him for he is our brother and uh, our flesh and his brethren were content. Now, Ishmaelites would be the, the probably equivalent of us calling uh, people in, in that uh, family Arabs. Okay? Specifically, Midianites, part of the Arab race. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is, they've come up with a, with a plan. They will sell their brother for the price of a slave. The Midianites passed by, and they drew, verse 28, Joseph out of the pit, and they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought uh, the, these uh, Midianites brought him to Egypt as a, and sold him for a slave there. It would seem to me from humans uh, thinking that it would be better for them to have killed Joseph than to have uh, set him up to suffer this way. And yet remember, remember Psalm 105, verse 17, God was in this and God was sending him ahead for a purpose. Joseph, found, uh, Joseph finds that out. Joseph shares that purpose. He, he knew it in his own head. I don't know if he knew it then, but he came to realize that God had sent him ahead for such a, a time as they would face. Look at the deception that they come up with, verse uh, 29. And Reuben, he was not around when this uh, transaction took place regarding Joseph. Reuben returned under the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. And he, he tore his clothes. And he returned to his brethren because he probably thought they pulled him out and they killed him while he was away. He returned to his brethren. He said, the child is not, and I, I don't know where he is. And they took Joseph's coat and they killed a goat and they dipped the coat in the blood and they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, this we have found. Know now whether it is thy son's coat or not. And he knew it. And he said, it is my son's coat, and evil beasts hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. 
and jo uh, Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. And his sons and his daughters, they rose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, I will go down to my grave mourning my son. And his father just wept for him. Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine the brothers not being concerned even about their father's grief when they see the degree of grief? So there's aggression followed by deception. And uh, you know what? This is so ironic, but it's so biblically true. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap, right? And Jacob is reaping what he sowed. Remember when he deceived his own father? How his, it was by the killing of a goat that the meat was made that was to taste like the venison that Esau would cook for him? Here a goat is killed. And that goat's blood is put on Jacob's coat of many colors, and then delivered back. And so, by a goat, Jacob deceived his father. By a goat, Jacob is deceived by his sons. And he totally fell for it. He accepted the evidence that was delivered. He believed their story. And he just concluded, he jumped to the conclusion that Joseph was dead. And he went into mourning, and the Bible says here, he refused all attempts to comfort him by his family. Why? Simply because Jacob refused to believe that God was in it. And that God was using that situation to shape him and his family and their future. And I would simply conclude with this thought. That while Jacob was moaning, God was moving. I want you to not forget that. While Jacob was moaning, God was moving. When we are weeping, God is working. I can't imagine a worse scenario than this for a family. Jacob certainly thought the worst, and I guess who can blame him? The end of the story, after Jacob's dead, and the brothers come in fear, cowering before Joseph, who is now the prime minister of Egypt, begging for mercy fearing that with dad gone, now his, Joseph's, wrath wouldn't be restrained. And they're begging for mercy, and, Jacob, uh, and Joseph weeps that they would think that he would get even with them. He said, it's not my place. Am I in God's place? Remember the Bible? Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Am I... God, and then he said this, and this is the Romans 8, 28 of the Old Testament. Genesis 50, 20. You heard of 20, 20 vision? You need 50, 20 vision. Genesis 50, 20, here it is. He, he looked his brothers in the eye, sadly, and he clued them in to what the whole story was for. He said this, ye meant it for evil but God meant it for good. So while people are mourning, God's moving. So while people are weeping, God is working. I think that you could possibly face anything in life based on that single truth. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And you know, you meant it for evil. All that you have done, you may not have realized it, but you have meant it for evil to God. By doing your own thing, by going your own way, by making your own choices, by ignoring the will of God in your life, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. And he is going to, in the end, reveal all of this.
I read about a dad, and perhaps I was the dad. I read about a dad that was holding his little three-year-old securely in his arms as he was uh, in a shallow end of a pool, and he would uh, walk a little farther, and the little boy, he was getting so scared, he was holding tighter and tighter as his dad was saying, you're going deeper, going deeper. <laughs> and as the water rose on the little uh, boy's uh, body, he just hugged more tightly to his dad. If he had the ability to analyze the situation, which he didn't, he would have realized that there was no reason to panic because the depth uh, of that water in any part of the pool was already over his head and he would have drowned. His safety anywhere in that pool depended on his dad. So he should have just been able to trust his dad in the deeper water just as easily he trusted his dad in the shallow water. You know, in various situations, you and I feel that we're in over our head. Maybe we lose something that's very valuable to us, or we lose someone. But the truth is, you and I are always over our head. But we're also held up by the grace and love of God. And if he ever let you go, you'd drown even in the shallow end. You can't keep yourself up in the shallow end even. If you're in deep waters, you're still in strong arms. And God's never out of his depth. And you can trust him even when the waters seem deeper and deeper than you've ever seen them before. If you're in the pits or in the pit, Remember, God's sovereign over all the details of your life. You can trust him to work it all together for good. And if you've never trusted him before, now's the time to start trusting him. Now's the time to trust him as your personal savior. Now's the time to recognize again that you must be born again. It's not an amazing, marveling thing that that's a requirement for the kingdom of heaven. Because you're a sinner in over your head. And he's the only one that can rescue you from eternal drowning in hell. So if you've never trusted him, this is the time for you to do so. And then, if you're a believer, you've trusted him, but you stop trusting him. For some reason, we stop trusting him. When it gets deep, we, get, we stop trusting him, it seems. Or sometimes, we can trust him in the deep part, but sometimes in the shallow part, we can't trust him. It's time to start trusting him again, if you're a believer. It's time to believe that he is holding you up and that you are not just holding around his neck. That underneath you are everlasting arms. That the Lord is your refuge. That no matter what you're in, underneath are everlasting arms. So Heavenly Father, I pray that you will just deal with our hearts from this life of Joseph about these simple things, yet so important these truths are. Anyone that's never trusted you as Savior, they're trying to stay afloat and hold themselves up by their own human effort. Show them they're drowning in sin. They'll perish in their sin unless they come to you and allow you to lift them by your grace. And those that are believers, that because of the loss of someone or something, have been floundering, moaning, while you're moving through this circumstance, weeping while you are working, Lord, open their eyes. Open the eyes of your people. Just like Elisha prayed that you would open the eyes of his servant Gehazi, who didn't see the hosts of the angelic army that was protecting them. Open their eyes, Lord. 
Give them the spiritual insight that Joseph spoke when he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. May they not take the line from Jacob's lips when he refused to be comforted, and he said, all these things are against me. Well, that might be true, but God's in it. May they see, may we see that as your people. And as we close this morning, if you need to trust Jesus as your personal Savior, do it now. Tell him you're a sinner and there's no hope for you. But ask Jesus who died in your place and took your punishment to save you and invite him to be your personal Lord and Savior. And if you're a believer, then you need help you need to trust the Lord in a certain area in your life. I'd like to pray for you. Whatever your need might be, spiritual or otherwise, physical, financial, I'd like to pray for you today. And I'd like uh, you to trust the Lord to work in your behalf. So if you want me to pray for you after we close this service, you please uh, speak to me and I'd be happy to take the time to do so.